we were talking about within the cooperative model, the value of working with genetics that are being bred on small farms because of our roots into the culture and how a lot of people coming into the industry, you know, they don't, they don't have access to that. So what they're gonna be having more of is more of those, you know, sour diesels, all the dessert flavors, all, you know, all of this. And it's really gonna be challenging as a small craft farmer to compete with their operation costs, their efficiencies at scale, and what they're able to bring the, uh, to the market. And of course, as a small farmer, we have the capability of, of growing a product that's more high quality because it's at small scale. But when it's just in a jar, in a glass case at a dispensary, all people are looking at is the jar and the THC and the price. And so really, again, it, it all brings it back to the ability to you know, have a story, tell that story and convey that to the, to the consumer. So yeah, anyway, um, welcome. I'm really glad you made the trip up and I'd love to hear what you have to say. Cool, thank you, man. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I've been thinking about a lot of these things um, really ever since I met Bam. Uh, I'm sitting in for Bam and Bam and I met each other about four or five years ago at a genetics conference after he posted something on Instagram talking about applied genomics in the cannabis space. And so the two of us got together, we went to the program, we studied applied genomics pretty much from 2015 onward together, um, you know, interacting through Instagram and through different social media networks. And uh, at that time, we kind of saw what was going on and we wanted to preserve and maintain what we had, because we knew what was coming. We knew that big agri-industry was going to be coming in, they were going to move into this space, and we know what they've done historically to every other crop and to every other small farming industry that has ever existed. We, there's a great chart, the chart that was posted announcing um, me coming to this event, it really shows the impact that that model has on genetic diversity, and that genetic diversity is directly correlated to cultural complexes. It's specific regional place-based cultures that develop things that are specifically adapted to their environments, and that's what gets lost in the big agri-industry model, and that's what if that takes over and that becomes just ubiquitous and the only thing that we have in cannabis, then that means all of us are gone. And that means that all of the heirloom varieties that we all loved and cherished and all the culture and everything that we've built for the last 30 years, 40 years that people have been, you know, engaging in this activity in the Americas as we kind of like since the hippies and everybody started smoking weed and really kind of found this thing again we are absolutely in a point right now where we could lose all of that. And there are large capitalized forces that are designed specifically with that goal and that objective in mind. And it's through events like this and through coming together and building resilience and cultural competency that we're going to be able to actually resist that. Um, the main reason I'm here today is because of what happened on the internet. Um, so, a couple weeks ago, Phylos Bioscience announced that they were going to be entering into the breeding space. If anybody doesn't know who Phylos Bioscience is, please go on to my Instagram, Sungrown Mids. Um, go on to YouTube, search Phylo Bioscience um, presentation. There's a presentation that was presented by Mowgli Homes to investors, large, agribusiness investors, the Monsantos, the Syngentas, the Dow DuPonts of the world. And in this presentation, Phylos, who has been collecting genetic samples from the community for the last four years, entering them into a large genomic galaxy and essentially sequencing all of our data. In this investors conference, Mowgli told the investors the following, all cannabis here to date basically sucks. It will be replaced in the next couple of years by optimized varietals. Phylos will be creating these varietals, and according to Mowgli, 
they have a number of competitive advantages that will preclude anyone else from entering into the cannabis breeding space. Specifically, their genomic data derived from the testing business, as well as a tissue culture operation, which will allow them to scale and gain market share more rapidly than any of their competitors or any of our traditional cannabis cultivators. Phylos's competitive advantage will be so great, according to Mowgli, that growing their plants won't be optional. Three, uh, in addition to this, uh, this is all being done with the end game and intent for Phylos to position themselves to be an attractive acquisition for the big four agricultural companies or to attract enough investment to scale up and become themselves the fifth big agricultural company. He specifically names members of the advisory board with links to Dow DuPont and Syngenta, as well as executives with experience in corporate exits. Their plan has always been to take our data, use the data to then put it into applied genomics, and take all existing plant material and genetic resources to develop their own optimized varietals. What that basically means is high-yielding, pest-resistant, they're claiming, varieties that are designed and created through selective pressures that are not based on genetic diversity, on these particular traits and qualities that we have developed in our specific local regions that we've been cultivating for decades. Instead, their model is one of absolute uniformity and maximization of the production. That's all they care about. It's all about market share and the margins that they're able to make off of the crop. That's all that matters. And that model has historically produced the results that we've seen in every other industry, particularly the grain industry, but specifically every crop, 75% of it is controlled by the four main agricultural industries. And to the extent that there are some anomalies where about 25% of market share is represented by traditional heirloom cultivators and small cultivators, those are rare, far and few between. And the only reason those exist is because people got together organized and actually preserve their cultural legacy and their genetic resources. Failure to do so literally means extinction. That's what we're posed with right now. And so that's why we need to get organized and we need to get back to our roots. We need to remember how we came here and how we preserved all of these plants and created all this diversity and the beauty that we love in this plant. The cultural traditions and everything that has brought us together is what we're seeking to preserve. And we need to go back and remember those dynamics. Specifically, right now, what's going on is that legalization has been an incredibly disorienting effect. People are scared. There are backwards bureaucracies we have to interact with, supply chains and markets that maximize inefficiencies as opposed to efficiencies that this is causing anxiety and forcing people into forced decisions and compromises in even the best circumstances. And more than that, we're facing capitalized operations with business plans that are specifically to sell below the cost of production to drive down costs and eliminate their competition. That means eliminating us. So we have to build resilience and we have to survive. We have to make it through these next few years to even have anything to look forward to in the cannabis space. It's moments like this that we need to rely on our culture and our traditions to cultivate the reliance necessary to confront these conditions. We need to get back to our roots, remember that we have always been adaptive and resilient. We need to remember that it was always about overgrowing the system. We have a responsibility to take leadership for preserving and adapting our culture and traditions to the current context. This is our culture, these are our traditions, that have brought us together. If we take leadership and accountability for them now, we will create the resilience that we need to survive. Everything we've done historically is what needs to be done now. We've already done this before. We figured out how to grow hundreds of pounds off of six plants when they imposed six plant limits. Like we can figure out to do incredible things in very confined spaces because we're adaptive and resilient people. And we just need to remember that and not allow the disorienting 
fear-based, zero-sum sort of dynamics that is being imposed upon us to take over and allow us to forget who we are and lose ourselves in this process. Um, a key part of this is education. These events, sorry, I'm not great with mics. Uh, these events are absolutely vital. This is how we learn, how we find each other, build permanent recurring opportunities to elaborate and strengthen our cultural bonds and traditions. We're all becoming forced to become experts on the fly. Everything from business to supply chain management to a whole host of things that a lot of people who started out because they loved pot and wanted to grow a plant that was illegal never thought they were going to be getting into. But We've all had to become experts. We've had to become legal experts. We've had to become regulatory experts. We've had to become economic experts. We've had to become scientists. And that's just rising to the moment. That's what we've always done, and that's what we'll continue to do. Additionally, we're being forced to, um, one of the primary issues that we're uh, being confronted with right now is an issue of scientific illiteracy. There are a lot of people who are very smart who were inspired to come and get involved in cannabis, and those individuals are people that we need to look to now. The people who actually understand science and who have been engaged in the sciences in their everyday lives, but also love cannabis, we need to find those people, we need to bring them into these spaces, we need to encourage them to become leaders in the cannabis space, because we need them now more than ever. We need to in develop our own cultural literacy and scientific literacy specifically. Um, one of the reasons why Phylos was able to do what they were able to do is because people honestly don't understand the technology and they don't understand the science around it. We need to de demystify plant breeding. This is one of the primary tasks that we have as a community. Plant breeding seems like wizardry. It seems incredibly complicated, but it's not. It's a very simple process of observing and engaging with your plant. That's all it really is. And selecting for things that you find desirable across time. That's all we're doing here. We need to encourage people just to get out there and do it. Do not sit back and think, oh, I don't have breeding stock, or I don't actually know how to do breeding, or that's what those other people do, experts do. We all can breed cannabis, and most of the cannabis that was bred throughout all of history was bred by people who didn't have PhDs and didn't have scientific backgrounds, but just instead selected for traits that they found desirable, and had cultural complexes that selected for those traits. And we can look through Central Asia and the cultural complex that arose around cannabis there and how that had impacts on the genetic resources and why Afghan plants are morphologically and chemically the way that they are. While, why South Indian and South Asian and African strains are the way that they are. That's because they were in specific cultural complexes they were isolated over time, and people selected for traits that they valued. So in South Africa, in South India, South Asia, Southeast Asia, they were selecting for high THC flowers. In the Central Asia and Afghanistan and the Middle East, they were selecting for hashish. And we can see the actual impacts that those selective pressures and those cultures had on the plant thousands of years later. And we've inherited that tradition and those cultural resources now. And it's upon us to make sure that down the line, hundreds of years from now, thousands of years from now, people don't look back on us at this time in this place as having fucked it all up. That's really what, what's going on right now. 